thank you so much for taking time out to talk to us. Um, I get the feeling you're quite busy because I was having a look at what you've been up to and since eventing season started about 10 days ago, you've been to three shows, I think, three events with around 15 horses or something, which is pretty crazy. Um, so you're quite busy, I guess. Yeah, it was definitely a baptism by fire. Uh, we had, um, I guess we've been looking forward to getting going again. We've kept the horses in work. They've all really come on and um, yeah, it was it was a great opportunity once once we got the all clear to get them out and, and also for for the owners as well, they've been you know hugely supportive, and yeah. uh, so we we wanted to just give them something to go to. And the, the first weekend uh, of the season, we had uh, we had um, three at Tweezel Down on the Friday, and then four at Barbary on Saturday, and four at Barbary on Sunday. I saw, yeah, that's quite quite committed. So, how many horses have you currently got in training? So um, I've got uh, about fourteen competing. Wow. Um, some are um, some some are young horses just starting off, right the way up to five star horses. So it's sort of the complete spectrum. In fact, I was uh, I was uh, just before we started on this call, uh, I was running through the five star test on one horse and then got straight off to long rein a three year old and then start backing it. Uh, so it's sort of one 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 extreme to another. It still fascinates me that you can go from different horses and also totally the different levels. So you might be doing. Um, you know the novice one day and then a four star you know do you have to mentally adjust every time you get a different horse and you and you jump a different course no I, I think you, you sort of do that automatically so um, you'll, you'll look at a fence and it look uh, verging on too big and it might be two foot nine uh, and then another <laughs> and, and then there's another fence which is a meter 35 and uh and and, and you say pop it up a couple of holes uh so it, it it's it's completely it's it, it it's that um sort of instinct i think that takes over where yes. you start to automatically see things through the context of or or through the eyes of the, of, of, okay. of the horse you're riding that, that, is, that is very interesting i mean talking about seeing through the eyes of the horse. I mean, you've been on horses since, well, since I'm, I'm imagining since before you could walk. Because eventing really is in your blood, isn't it? You're born into equestrian royalty. Your dad having won three Olympic gold medals, which is um, fairly impressive and also fairly formidable. How important has he been in, in your career? We were incredibly close. Uh, we had a sort of very, very close um, bond and relationship right from when I was a little baby. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and then having that common ground I've got a brother and sister who who you know both rode as, as children and 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 still occasionally get on a horse, but um, it was very much a sort of bond be- between the two of us, and it was sort of you know it was just it was something we really shared. So uh, yeah, he 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 was hugely influential. A lot of boys can have that with their fathers, you know, successful fathers, and it's, it can be intimidating. And not many people have people have fathers that have won three Olympic gold medals. I think the thing is because I uh, knew no difference; it it was the norm, and. Uh, it, it meant to a certain extent that what he did, although it was outstanding in some ways, uh, to me, it seemed completely achievable. So it was there for something which, you know, I, I thought, well, if he did this, I want to do this. Um, so it, it probably meant that I, from day one, uh, set sort of unreasonably high targets for myself. In a way, that's probably been part of, um, it, 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 it's been hugely beneficial that I've always sort of push myself to try and reach reach the very top i've read that you spent most of your childhood in saddle not not as unsurprisingly one really interesting thing i read and i want you to explain it to me it said less in the form of tuition and competition so you spent a lot of time in your saddle but not so much about tuition and competition so can you explain more about that was it just about having fun rather than your dad sort of you know sending yeah, you around the dressage arena yeah he, he was a big believer that children learn to, to do things, whether it's speaking a language or whether it's playing a sport or, you know, simple things. They, they learn through, um, largely through self-exploration and that if you try and te- teach in a cognitive way, in the same way as you might teach adults, uh, you, you, you almost suppress a lot of the natural ability and self-discovery, um, okay. which, which actually is, is far more effective than any taught method. So, um, I think it was sort of there was there was there were two aspects to it. One was uh, that it was important for 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 him that we just enjoyed it. You know, they, yeah. my parents were never uh, that keen on any of us um, following him into the sport because you know they, they they wanted us all to ride, but they they also knew there was a lot of um, you know there's a lot of work, a lot of sacrifices, um, a lot of disappointments. Um, yes. That it is you know it is quite a tough environment, um, and they they probably. 
discouraged as much as encouraged um you know and it had yes. a sort of a healthy grounding but also on the actual writing side um he was a little bit protective of, of being taught so it meant that you know if you look at children they they um they actually write in a very good balance just generally and children you know right up to a fence and they don't try and see a distance they just they arrive at the fence and they don't fold they just they don't fall off the back they don't fall off the front they you know they, they tend to develop good hands they they develop a good sense of balance and and they also develop the ability to kick um when, yes. when needed and, and actually you know, then children go often through a sort of um a phase of learning bad habits when they're being taught you know which often includes overfolding or starting to interfere with the rain or starting to you know it 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 it, it can definitely be something which is um wrong and and, and I've noticed now I've you know I've got two children I was going to say are, are you using the same process the same learning process for your kids yes I I I I've got two children who are 8 and 6 and they they love riding they're um, they're they're very keen and uh, and and again for me I'm not at all worried about whether they go on to have a competitive career or whether they just ride for fun. You know I'd be sad if they didn't ride, but for me the most important thing is the you know that that the enjoyment of a life with horses and whether they want to go on and and, and take it on as a profession is totally up to them. But in 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 putting them on horses and and uh, or, or on ponies and 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 letting them uh, develop, I I I watched a friend's uh, daughter trotting towards a fence um yeah a fence being six inches high but uh with with both her hands uh pressing on the withers so she, yes. and she was sort of bouncing on her knees and that's apparently what her riding instructor had told her uh really? whereas ours ours tend to just you know just play games so i'll give them i'll give them an apple and and tell them they've got to they've got to just go around a little course of tiny little you know poles on the ground virtually with with uh the apple and they've got to swap hands every now and then with the apple but it, the idea is they st- they've got something else to think about and the rest all just yes. happens on, on, yes. on their own yeah. um so, are, they yeah. sh- are they showing an interest in eventing yeah they are um i mean my my little boy uh, who's six uh did announce the other day that he'd thought very hard about it and had decided he was probably going to do Bramham and Blenheim before he did Badminton and Burley. <laughs> <I love that. laughs> now, speaking of your son, Charlie, I know that he had quite an unusual entry into the world, didn't he? He did. Um, so you delivered the baby at home. Not only did you deliver the baby at home, but you had both arms in braces following a rather serious fall. Is this correct? Yes. Yeah, it is. It was, um, I think, I think both experiences of, of the... Uh, Four, which was the, the uh, most unenjoyable experience of my life. Uh, I shouldn't probably put them uh, in the same category talking about the birth of my son because it was meant to be a wonderful moment, but it was it was uh, mildly frightening. Was it was it utterly terrifying? I, I think I, I've always reckoned that I'm quite well sort of cut out for a crisis. You know that if if something happens, I've been in a few situations yes. where you know something awful has happened. I've been a bystander and you know sort of. Uh, you know if if people are panicking you know you have a sort of reasonably level head on you but this was the one uh one thing on the curriculum of life that i sort of really uh didn't intend to have any kind of um leadership role in um, so did the and... baby just come the baby just came quickly basically yes yeah so you on yeah. the phone to the midwife so it was, well initially rosie said that um uh, it was about four o'clock in the morning she woke up and um she thought she was uh she had a tummy ache, which considering she was um, nine nine months and ten days, or nine months and nine days. I love that she calls it a tummy yeah, ache. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's and, and, and it was fairly it was fairly obvious what was happening. Uh, but anyway, it all happened very quickly, and um, and we called the midwife. who said go into the hospital. We but call them first. We called the hospital. They said don't come in. You'll have the baby on the way. Call an ambulance. Call the so ambulance. How, sorry to be sorry. I've had two kids. How do they know you didn't have because, time to touch them close the, together? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. is it true now that you had to find out how dilated your wife was? Is this true? Yes, yeah, and I was asked to be very specific about this. Um in fact th- there is a a story which um which I wasn't brave enough to tell until a few years afterwards. Uh but she couldn't understand at one point why I was walking around with a mirror in my hand, uh plucking up the courage to for... <laughs> anyway, I, <laughs> I I I ended up having to be very uh very specific almost with a ruler. Um wow. but um my yeah. goodness, that's that's yeah. 
no place any man wants to necessarily go, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, amazing. And so, and were your hands in in were they still in braces at that point? Um, they were um in, in sort of mobile braces. So so wow. I um I yeah I was um. I I probably had about half the normal movement, so by that stage I could feed myself, and um, yeah, I wasn't totally uh, um, sort of disabled, but I uh, was was not exactly normal. Well, that is quite remarkable, and I'm, I'm sure it's part of the great bond you have with your child, having given having delivered him, which is pretty amazing. So, I mean, obviously we've spoken about the fact your arms are in braces after you had in 2013 a pretty horrific fall, and both arms fractured. Is that right? And or oh, elbows fractured and dislocated. <laughs> Yeah, they, they they both shattered um, because I it was it was a rotational fall, so you know the horse somersaulted over a fence, um, and it, you can't. The problem with rotational falls is you basically can't roll away because the trajectory is straight down into the ground. Yeah. So it was it was like um, I mean I remember it totally vividly, oh. and it was basically like jumping off a diving board into an empty swimming pool, um, and the only thing I could do uh, to to basically probably stop my neck breaking yes. uh, was to put, put my arms straight out um, the, the, uh, and my arms were out straight and they both locked straight and snapped backwards at the elbows um, oh my and, goodness. Then the, and then the horse landed on me um, and so they, they basically went to um, one of them ha- had uh, uh, um, sort of had, had basically gone to powder it was like a, it was like taking an egg cap uh, egg cup and just smashing it onto a concrete floor Wow. So, and you were told you weren't, is it true that you weren't going to ride again or event again? Yeah. So, so initially, um, when I, when I came around for my first lot of operations where they, they actually took out all the bones, um, because they were, um, shattered so badly. They were... So you just, is it all metal now? Are you, are you? Uh, is, so, so, so initially what they did was they took out the bones and they tried to actually do a mosaic, uh, with the pieces to try and work out which bits went where, um, to rebuild them. And I had quite a few days, uh, with, no bones in the arms and I was just hanging from hooks uh, on the ceiling wow. with, with the arms open wow. uh, and they and they then rebuilt them and I had two amazing surgeons one was a top elbow specialist and the other was a limb reconstruction surgeon who normally works with um, you know soldiers who step on landmines and, and things like that and they and they, uh, they worked together to put them back together um, and uh, one of them is, is still got quite a lot of metal, metal work in and the other one I actually had the metal work taken out um, wow. a year later wow and so but did they did what I assume at that point you were thinking your career was over? What well, they think? they when I when I came round uh, in the morning of, um, from the first order of operations, a um, very nice um, reconstruction surgeon was there, and he said you've got to think of the recovery um, in terms of years, not months. Quite incredibly, you then within months were at badminton, which I imagine your family were fairly horrified by, weren't they? I mean, so it was February, February, you're back riding. Yeah, and and, and and March off to badminton. I basically left it until the last possible day. I reckon I get a ho- I could get a horse fit enough to go to badminton. Was the first day I tried to get back on, and and I say tried because it was very much with a very open mind that I thought that I wouldn't be able to use them. And and, and when people have injuries and 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 can't do something. It, 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 it's actually quite simple it's it's not really about will and stubbornness it's more uh, and it's not even about pain at, at that point it's it's about whether structurally things will stay together mm. um and, and, and so whether you can physically uh you know hold a rein or Absolutely. move in, 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 yeah. in the right range and things um and actually i was very limited in what i could and couldn't do but i could hold the reins and i could uh i i could stop a horse so i i tried that by getting on and having a walk the first day and then i got on the second day and went up onto the gallops how did you mentally come back and and yeah to basically challenge one of the toughest courses in the world i suppose digest the fact that actually it would be normal in this kind of situation for somebody's confidence to have taken a battering i was I, you know i i i was prepared to uh you yeah, know probably have you know an extra cross country school or two than I would do normally start them all at a lower level than I would do normally yes. go to, I went to my first ever unaffiliated competition uh before I went Did to you? do a proper one yeah you know, and actually I realized that as soon as when I turned up to cross country school the first sort of horses um 
for, for, for the first time since since the accident. Um, I'd also sort of in my mind sort of lined up somebody who I would call if I wanted to sort of chat through any sort of um, issues as a sports psychologist. Um, okay. um, and, and, and as soon as I jumped the first lot of fences, uh, I felt, I, I, I thought I've got all of these plans which are completely uh, unnecessary really? because as soon as I as soon as I jumped the first lot of fences, I just thought, you know what, this is totally who I am, what I do, mm, where fantastic. I feel absolutely, uh, you know, again, nothing to do with competing, nothing to do with wanting to be, you know, sort of have huge aims and goals. Just it's it's totally your in your zone that you feel completely yes. where you belong. Yeah, yeah. Um. So so in a way, I think having all of those other things in place, uh, were sort of belt and braces in case I needed them. And yes. I did still go through with a lot of them, um, but, but actually they, they weren't necessarily needed. And but you, maybe if I hadn't made those plans, yeah. then, then yeah, and you'd been determined that you weren't going to be affected by it, maybe that kind of thing just eating away, then um, the pressure builds and becomes an issue a few months later. Um, and obviously, quite incredibly, well, you came third. So you really were back in third at badminton, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. which is really, it's a fairy tale ending, isn't it? I mean, it's quite remarkable. And obviously credit to your, you know, to Amazing Horse, Wild Loan. One of the things of a recovery is about having hope and direction. And I had this um, sort of, you know, this dream that I wanted to try and have a second chance to compete. And I had this sort of wonderful horse who, you know, I'd had since he was a four-year-old um, and was just coming into his sort of, uh, mat- maturity mm-hmm. and, and so in a way that sort of partnership and uh sort of bond to 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 want to be able to go and compete was a sort of huge driving factor in 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 I guess the motivation behind my recovery yeah and you obviously you had a very incredible relationship with him and then tragically I mean it was I mean goodness we all know horses up and down but you really did have quite an exceptional roller coaster because then later that year um at the world equestrian games you did an amazing clear round and then while he was calling down he slipped fell and died I mean it's just um yeah I mean how you know it was it was a tough time for you wasn't it yeah I mean that that was just um horrendous in 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 in, in that he was always a very difficult horse to cool down um so I mean it sounds like the cavalier saying he, he slipped and fell but he, he was a horse who would be so full of adrenaline he was generally quite a quiet sort of introvert sort mm. of introvert mm. kind of character but he post cross country he was um he, he was an absolute sort of um uh sort of ball of adrenaline and excitement and he was was always very difficult to cool down and the sight there mm. uh the the finish uh was was was, was a very long and, and narrow on the side of a steep slope and um and and he um in, in the cooling down process um he 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 slipped and um you know, we thought that he'd he'd winded himself and would get up, and 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 he didn't. And I mean, that was just completely heartbreaking. And you know, again, yeah, it's hard on a number of levels. But yes, yeah, again, aside from aside from competing, aside from the fact that you've you've, you've got this amazing horse that's you know, is doing so well at the top level, it was mm, it was mm. just actually your your, you know, your your sort of part of your family you know your your yeah yeah be- best best friends you know the one you spend sort of you know a decade with um uh you know and and, and has been absolutely at the forefront of why you you get out of bed in the morning and what mm. you do with your mm. entire sort of training program is based mm. around your horses and when you've got a you know a horse that's your you inevitably have horses that you have a particularly close bond with um and you know sometimes are the ones you've had the longest sometimes are the ones you think are the most talented um it's it's always hard but i'm you know lots of people who ride you know know that feeling and you know you're you're lucky to have had them in the first place yeah i mean you have had some amazing horses in your career it's also another horse i wanted to speak to you about was um a horse that when you were with william because you were with william fox pit weren't you trained you were with you were stable jockey for william fox pit for a while Yes. And there was a horse there that you took on called Midnight Dazzler, who launched your four-star career, I believe. And he was another quite tricky horse. Can you tell me a little bit about him? The first time I saw him was at, at Blenheim, uh, where he, um, he, he, he he was notoriously difficult in the dressage and, and would boil over and, um, you know, sweat up and, and, and become 
you know, sort of almost unrideable. And um, he, he'd, he'd done that in the dressage. And I remember watching him in the cross country and, you know, you had the world number one sort of most elegant rider on this beautiful, almost black thoroughbred horse. Um, and he, I remember seeing him uh, galloping across the lake at Blenheim, which is you know, one of those iconic shots mm, mm. and seeing him get to the step up to the rail. You, you jumped a step, bounced over rail and seeing William ride him absolutely perfectly up to the step and the horse tried to jump the whole thing in one <gasps> chest of the rail and they both fell. And oh. he was he was a horse who was he was very highly strung um, and he he sort of quite often had problems like that and he would blow up in the dressage he would um you know he, he had quite a few falls cross country uh because it was almost like his brain was going so fast yeah. um you know he would make he would make quite fundamental yes. mistakes like that yeah. um and so i i uh sort of took on the ride because um he was deemed as probably be a uh sort of disposable young boys uh ride rather than um a, 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 you know somebody who uh m- may have been there and done that and actually not once not not once ride a horse like that anymore yes and, and i remember thinking you know, you're he, young he was... and foolish enough to take him on exactly exactly and, and and he was he was it was the end of his 13th year that i took him on and i remember you know really he was he was very difficult to ride i remember at home really just taking the attitude that you know he, he i'm going to put in everything of myself you know I'm going to just empty myself to try and get the best out of this horse and and a lot of it was about understanding why he was so difficult so so riding him at home he would he's the kind of horse who would hold his breath and run sideways across the school and bump into the um post and rails on the side and then go sideways across and bump into the other one and then wow. if there were jumps in the way he'd flatten the jumps and he just had that sort of r- real um ability to bustle up pressure and mm. just it would come out in an explosive way and you were sort of trying to understand what it was and why he was motivated mm. by that and I it was a great bit of psychology because what I tried to do after a while was to become a little bit like um if you if you tie a horse up to a wall the horse doesn't fight the wall because the wall has no emotion so the wall doesn't hit the horse and the wall doesn't give in to the horse either. Mm. The, the, the wall is just totally non-reactive, but consistent. And I thought, right, whatever happens, I'm going to just stay here. My legs are not going to move. So if he wants to run sideways and squash me up against something, you know, I'm not going to give him a kick, but I'm also not going to take my legs off and sit there wow. passively. And he was... You know, he 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 went through one of his phases and was, and was very difficult. And then after about 15, 20 minutes, he just stood in the middle of the school and went... <laughs> and just breathed and stopped wow. and then was relaxed and trotted away and he i had to go through the same thing almost every day but it got shorter and shorter at the time and then he became more and more rideable and likewise cross country i just let him lob really in a very relaxed way just lob across country so he had time to process and see so it wasn't yes. saying whoa whoa slow down it was just allowing him to travel with no pressure so you might still be going at a reasonable speed but you were going without without pressure so his brain wasn't sort of operating too fast mm. he had time to process things um and he uh he 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 then went on to become one of the most um consistent horses competing at at, at top level he 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 did um he did i think something like um uh six badmintons and five burleys and wow. um was was absolutely brilliant wow well incredible incredible testament to you and your perseverance and so you were with william at the time how big an influence was he on your career and and do you still does he still help you out now mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so, so so he was a, a big influence. I, I guess you have sort of a few people who really uh, shape you, not so much in a, in a sort of training sense, but more in a sort of, um, I guess, I- ideology or sort of mentoring or sort of you know comparing yourself to mm, them. And mm. like I said at the beginning, you know, I, I, having having my father, in a way, as a comparison, meant that you know the standard that you hold against yourself is is very high, and then William is the other person. And so yeah, two time... fairly high benchmarks you got there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and, and and what I loved about being with William was his attitude to the horses, and the attitude to the people in the yard, and his attitude to owners. You know, he was he he's a he's a really really good guy. He is kind. He really cares about his horses, mm. um, and you know he, he he and he's quite fun and light-hearted as well you know he's he's um you know he he very much takes people on the journey and 
yeah, for me, it was it was it was a, a lot of the, I guess, layers of education on the horsemanship side. Mm. You know, he he added to that for me, mm. but also um, in more than that in, in in how you sort of set up your yard how you you know your how, how you operate um on a day-to-day basis you know your relationship with your owners your relationship with mm. you, you know the t- team on the yard you know all, all of those kind of things and he he was very much somebody who yeah I would look to and I would ask a lot of questions and, and something I've always had is a really inquiring mind and I would have asked millions of questions and um and, and, and of other people as well but um, you know, William was very definitely a sort of a, a great mentor and, and, and became a really good friend and we're still great friends to this day and uh, we see each other a lot and, um, you know, he's definitely somebody who I'm I'm thankful he's still competing because, you know, he's, he's you know, we, we'd, we would try and park next to each other or if we're yes. going abroad, we'd, we'd, we'd buddy up and go in the same lorry. Obviously, you are so aware, all, all riders are aware of what can go wrong with horses, but due to your accident, you may be more aware of some of the horrors of, of a bad fall so with your children how do you keep them safe um, while also encouraging them to be brave and to enjoy their horses I fundamentally believe that um, you, you, it should be fun and you, we shouldn't be too mollycoddling um, but what I would do is always make sure that they're wearing the right stuff. So instead of being neurotic about it and saying oh you can't do this you can't do that I'd say look actually you know they would always ride in a in a really good hat and with Charles Owen we're sort of you know we know we've got the absolute sort of yes. latest and best um and the same with body protectors but but within that that they've got to have the freedom to go and um you know the, I do think that self-discovery is quite a big part of it mm-hmm. and riding with liberty and riding with freedom and mm-hmm. um it's that instinct where you don't think you know it's mm-hmm. that instinct where you've you've already done something correctly before it's even got to your brain yes, yes. um and and th- that's something which i think children have to be able to sort of have the freedom to do and not and not have neurotic parents so we've got some questions here from charles owen fans sent in a few questions now we've talked a lot about your childhood with your dad ruby june worrell would like to know uh who was your first pony <laughs> My first pony was a little pony called Tom Thumb, who uh, I've got a brother That's who's... A great name. Yeah, I've got a brother who's um, 18 months old and a sister who's 18 months younger, and I sit, sit in the middle. Um, and he was one which they didn't want to ride because he was quite naughty. Um, and uh, anyway, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed him and loved him, and he was the best thing in the world. And actually, he probably wasn't the best pony in the world, but he was the one who totally got me... Uh, got me into into riding. Millie E zero seven would like to know what do you like best about owning horses. I used to love competing and just had dreams of competing at the top level, which I still very much do, and it's it's it, it's still what motivates me every day. But I have become um, increasingly um, probably soppy about uh, <laughs> producing young horses. I've got I've, most of the horses I've got. Uh, you know, we we've had since they were three and four year olds, and mm. um, we've produced through the levels. And I I love getting on young horses and um, and seeing them uh, develop and seeing them improve and you know very very ordinary little mm. things that they do. Uh, you can get very excited about and uh, it's that sort of deep sense of satisfaction um is is something which i sort of really enjoy i thought i wouldn't become one of those people who just spends their life getting terribly excited about uh young horses but um and I'm, that's who you I'm are i'm enjoying that that's who i am yeah that's who you are <laughs> so we're following on from that bella miller too wants to know what drives you to fu- to fulfill your goal so is it is it the pleasure of bringing on the young horses is it the is it competing for your country is it wanting to win badminton or burley one day like your dad did i i think um there's a number of things and and, and they all combine um you know one is definitely competing for your country i mean it's, it's absolutely uh is different to everything you know when you're when mm. you're at a championships and you you know there is a responsibility with that you know you, and also the selection process is sort of very arduous and you know that you know you, you, you're fortunate to be there ahead of other people and you know you've got to go and do a good job but also you know there's an element that's you know history is being written and 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 you want to make sure you you know you're you're part of that and yeah um you you you, you do justice um 
on on the scoreboard. But but I think most of all, it's about uh, it's about the, the excitement and the occasion. I mean, the big events like badminton and Burley with huge crowds, the history, mm. you know, the, the 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 amazing settings. The you know, it, it it's it's enough to give you goosebumps just to mm. uh, walk out under the arch at badminton and, and see see the crowds and you know you you, you feel that. And it's, I'm sure it's the same as anyone walking onto the pitch of Wembley out of the tunnel or, or on centre court of Wimbledon or, or anything. But, but but also there's something which is e- even simpler, which just comes back to the horses, which is even if there were no crowds, no, um, you know, no record books, no competition, it's that feeling that this is what you do and wanting to be tested, wanting to... Um, I, I sometimes talk about... Um, I, I, I don't know if you remember... The film Point Break, uh, where yeah, they where, 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 where there's a hundred year wave, the huge wave, which which uh, the the diehard surfers uh, jump in their cars and go against the traffic to get to get into the sea to surf the hundred year wave, and it's that feeling that you want to be tested to the absolute maximum. Mm. You, you, you you you've got confidence in your horse, you've got confidence in in what you can do together, and having the opportunity. It's not about being watched. It's not about proving a point to anyone. It's just that feeling of doing something to a really high standard just for the two of you just for you and the horse yeah. and, and 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 having the opportunity to do that and I know that that's what I will miss most of all one day when I stop competing that's that's a very good answer um I've got quite a big question for you next which is from xx chloe wx wants to know top tips five top tips okay on being an amazing rider five top tips okay yeah. so I I would say this um I'm going to count. Them. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, always be inquisitive. Keep asking questions. Okay. One. Yeah. Yeah. Um, always have patience. Two. Yep. Just loads of patience, uh, and 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 be prepared to go whatever pace uh, you you need to go with that horse. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to split that into two. So have patience with the horse. Yes. Yep. But the other thing is, in your method of producing a horse, don't move up until everything is totally like all phases are completely established yeah and even then still don't move up re-establish them re-establish them re-establish okay. them until when you move up you don't even know you've moved up okay okay that's three yeah um <laughs> so um um you know there has to be an element of tenacity and resilience um you know there's the things aren't going to go well the whole time and I think if you if you want something enough, then you keep going when keep, yeah everything's saying don't keep going. Um, so that's yeah having you know I, I guess being able to handle disappointment and not taking it personally, not blaming or anything, but just uh, keep looking forwards. Um, and number five, number five, uh, look at the small details. Um, often if you look at the little details and you get them right, the big details look after themselves. So it's about, you know, and this is, this is down to sort of, you know, if you're, if you're working, it doesn't really matter what phase you're doing or what discipline you're doing. But if mm-hmm. you, uh, if, 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 if you, you know, for example, show jumping, if you get, you know, the basics of your, your, your line, you know, the quality of cancer, the position, you know, the, out, you know the, the 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 way of going of the horse mm-hmm. relaxation you know the length of the neck the softness around us but, but with the activity you know those kind of things if you get those really nailed even doing really basic lower level exercises and you have to mm-hmm. compete at then actually it's it makes competing at a higher level very easy brilliant thank you very much millie b1213 would like to know what one thing would you change in your career is there anything you change you're so used to looking forwards. You're so used to, um, you know, sort of always looking at how you can do things better and um, and not reflecting too much on the past. Um, but I've always tried to treat every horse like it's the only horse I have. Um, so that if, if you have one horse and it might be, with hindsight, the best horse you ever sat on, Instead of thinking, oh, if only I could change what I did with them, if only I can change how I produced them, if only I could do this differently, that hopefully we try and get that right first time round. And it can make it really hard in terms of the extra pressure I put on myself as much as anything time-wise because you're trying to divide yourself into so yeah, many different really, roles. Yeah, and, 14 horses. Yeah, but it's, but it's, it, 
it, it is worthwhile. So probably if I was going to say what, what would I change, I probably would have, you know, I've got a really great team around me now. And, uh, you know, my wife, Rosie, is uh, she sort of is in charge of the, the logistics of, I guess, managing my movement and diary and things like that. Mm. We've got Jess, my head groom, who's been with me for 12 years. We've got a really great team of riders on the yard. Um, and we've got uh, KP who works in the office. You know, we've got a really good team, and I guess probably to have divided some of the responsibilities away from me onto other people earlier would have probably made my life easier. Um, so you've not so, been that not been that great at delegating in the past. I think I think it's it's it, um, it takes time to grow. You know, you start off and okay, it's you. Yes, yes. And then course, it starts yeah. off and you you and one groom, and then it starts off with you know maybe three of you and then four of you. So I think um, you know now I realise sort of what you know how, how yes it it allows you to do things to a much higher standard. Um, if if you've got sort of a great team of people around you, but it takes time and resources to get to a stage where you can do that. It does. Um, I've got the final three questions now, which is three questions we asked to all our riders, which was, if I wasn't a rider, I would be a... It's very difficult to know that because I didn't grow up wanting to be an astronaut or a you know, soldier or anything else. I wanted. To, I grew up you know, from two years old wanting to win badminton and <laughs> the Olympics and things like that. So, um, But I, uh, I, I like architecture. Uh, I did a degree in history of art, um, so maybe something on that route. But I can't imagine a life without horses. So I, I did used to um, think that I potentially had made a bad mistake not becoming a national hunt jockey. Um, it, it was never oh, okay. really an option for me to do that in that it wasn't something that was hugely on my radar until I'd already gone down the route sort of with both feet uh, into the eventing world. And I always wondered if if... Yeah, I'm fortunate enough. I'm the right size. It's you know a lot of that aspect of things is what I sort of found, mm. you know, reasonably natural and things. But actually now I've got to an age where I'd be very much at the end of my career as a national hunt jockey. I'm I'm very grateful that you know I've still got plenty of time ahead of me and I'm happy doing what I'm doing. What you wish you'd known ten years ago? I wish that I'd been given a shopping list of clothes or just given a bundle of clothes because uh we spend it looks very glamorous uh doing what we're doing uh in some amazing places in the sunshine but we ride yeah i, I have a sort of principle that we never ever miss days training uh due to um the weather so if we can get the horses out of their stables even if that means we've got to shovel snow for three hours uh first we get them out and they and they you know they they're able to work um and so the amount of time I've been drenched to the bone, um, I, uh, it's taken me a long time to find out what actually does keep you dry, um, and what does keep you warm. And, uh, yeah, I would have liked to have been given those clothes. Um, you could also argue years that, ago. you could also argue that the technology has evolved over the last 10 years and what you're wearing now might not have existed 10 years ago, but I, uh, probably <laughs> the only person who wear, um, I remember my father wearing in the sort of eighties, um, a pair of galoshes. I was going to say um, galoshes as a joke. Yeah, you actually wore yeah. galoshes. I wear galoshes now. <laughs> galoshes stop in, in leather boots. Galoshes stop the water uh, going into the source, particularly if you're Are teaching. Are they not a bit so, baggy? No, no, you get, you get, t- 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 get sort of. Very tight glosses that, that, that look look like a pair of shoes on black boots. Yeah, almost invisible. They're very stylish. You, you give it a few years, and everybody will be wearing them. Hey, that's your top fashion tip. <laughs> yeah. uh, fashion tips with Harry Mead. Okay, and then I'm happiest when. I'm probably happiest. Um, so we we bought the yard uh, where we, we rented for the last fifteen years, and um, and where I grew up, and. Um, and so we're now on site with the children and we have, um, yeah, we've sort of built it up and refenced everything. And, 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 and my happiest time is, uh, we've only been, you know, sort of actually living on site mm-hmm. since, since November. So now this, this wow. summer, um, my, I'm happiest in the evening when everyone's finished and gone in and I walk out, um, and I walk out into the fields and you just see lovely horses in lovely fields completely happy totally quiet and it's that sort of deep sense of calm and contentment well doesn't get better than that does it really thank you so much for talking to us it's been an absolute pleasure 
and for um yeah sharing your many interesting and um sometimes slightly alarming stories with us thank <laughs> you very much thank you, Harry. thank you thank you